really happy to introduce uh, Aisha Torah from Concordia University. Um, <laughs> I think an expert in nanoparticle self-assembly using these are micelle reactors. She got her PhD in 2006 from University of Toronto, I think, sorry. Yeah. And then did a, um, had a fellowship at the Max Planck Institute, and then um, went to, worked at McMaster, where she was director of Center of Emerging um, Technologies, some awards, a, 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 some nice, nice awards, like I think a, what was it, Petroleum Award, young, yeah, yeah. young investigator. Yeah. And then um, just uh, this year, she moved to Montreal. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. And thanks very much for this invitation. And sorry for the technical delay. You know, the more the more we advance technologically, the worse things get sometimes, I feel. But, uh, but here we are. All right. So thank you very much for that invitation. As uh, as Walter said, my name is Aisha Turak. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work. Most of the, a lot of the work that we did, I've been doing at McMaster for many, many years, and that we're now continuing now that I've joined Concordia in the Department of Physics. So uh, basically, I, I, you know, I'm using all the buzzwords in my my TED Talk kind of title, but but the real gist of it is we're really trying to use reverse micelle synthesis to make a wide variety of nanoparticles that we then can apply in different kinds of of applications. And so the idea is to really to drive engineering with nanoscience. That's sort of the we're, we're all using all the buzzwords. This is our buzzy word. So I wanted to give you kind of an overview of what we do and sort of see, so you can see what some of the power of these, of the tools that we have that we've developed over the years. So <clears throat> of course I have been, it's not me mostly, it's mostly, it's just the students really, to be fair, they do all the work, all the hard the heavy lifting. And so I wanted to acknowledge them right off the bat. And um, currently this is, well, this is actually a little older picture of my group, um, but uh, we're, we're sort of like <clears throat> eight or nine strong here at uh, Acting Cordia. There's still a couple of students still at McMaster, so we're kind of, kind of straddling both institutions at the moment. And, uh, but there's been a wide variety of people working on these topics over, over many, many years. <clears throat> so I want to acknowledge them off that. Now, we're talking in this context about functional nanoparticles, because of course, there's lots of nanoparticles that exist as nanoparticles, but the ones that are, the ones that we're interested in are the ones that are sort of most useful are the ones that we can actually used to extract some interesting properties. Right? We all know the Nobel Prize this year was, was given for quantum dots. The, the world of nanoparticles and everything at the small scale, at the nanoscale, is really where material properties start to sort of go sideways, right? And so we want to we want to harness those sort of things for a wide variety of applications. And in fact, you know, these applications that I'm showing here <clears throat> have had some success uh, with nanoparticle approaches, but one of the key limitations for nanoparticles is always heterogeneity at a scale that is large enough for something to be useful from an application perspective, right? So the real goal, if we want to have high performance, <clears throat> if we want to have high performance, it helps to have uniform monodispersed nanoparticles. And then there's there could be an added bonus of having them in kind of an organized array so you can take advantage of collective properties, right? So if we wanted to make a, a nanoparticle kind of device, it'd be nice to have something that looks like this. So we have evenly spaced particles that are all of uniform size that are made using a two dimensional array. Right? That's something that's very controllable, something that we can actually achieve. <clears throat> now, the way that we have approached this problem is to use something called reverse micelle synthesis. And I'm going to talk about it in more detail, but this is the sort of snapshot <clears throat> cartoon of what's going on. The principle is to use these dye block copolymers that spontaneously form micelles in different solvents. And I'll talk a bit about this story later. To, as, as kind of a nano reactor within which we make the nanoparticles. And then we choose this kind of a two dimensional curve. Uh, now, I always like to show this picture because this is the sort of the propaganda, like this is what we want to achieve. But this is an AFM image of nanoparticles that we make in our lab, right? So, with this sort of a technique, we can actually achieve uniform monodispersity that has very, very small polydispersity index <clears throat> in terms of the diameters, as well as arranged in basically a closed pack configuration. Okay. So this is the sort of propaganda cartoon and that's a real AFM image of these particles. Okay. So this is an achievable outcome. <clears throat> so how do we do that? Well, so this is a little bit of the chemistry, right? So I mean, this is the, <clears throat> the physics of materials and material science at its essence is kind of you know where physics and chemistry meet. So unfortunately you have a little bit of chemistry in there. I'm a material scientist by training. Not a chemist, so <clears throat> I like to sort of blend those worlds sometimes. But a little bit of chemistry that I mentioned is just all at the front here. <clears throat> what we do basically is take 
an amphiphilic unimer, right? So amphiphilic means that it has one hydrophobic and one hydrophilic end, right? So it's a polymer that has these two, this dual nature. And typically we use <clears throat> polystyrene two vinyl pyridine, which is basically just sort of benzene type rings <clears throat> attached to a long backbone. And the, the polystyrene portion where we have no nitrogen is the hydrophobic part. And the <clears throat> two vinyl pyridine, excuse me, where we have nitrogen is the hydrophilic part, which right? so is the one that's more more interested in water, less interested in water. So these two particular, when you take a dibloc copolymer that has these two components, you put them into some solvents above some kind of critical concentration called the critical micelle concentration. These sorts of molecules will spontaneously combine into a macromolecule called the micelle. Mm -hmm. right? and basically, a micelle is just a kind of conglomeration of these larger scale mm -hmm. nanoparticles Sorry, pardon me, the larger scale universe that sort of come together. Yeah. So above this critical micelle concentration, they'll spontaneously form this macromolecule. And if you put it into a polar solvent for historical reasons, what happens is that the, the hydrophobic ends go inside and the hydrophilic ends are on the outside. And that's what we refer to as a micelle. Right. And we've all actually experienced this sort of uh, material because this is what soap is. Right? So it doesn't have it doesn't have a hydrophobic end, it has an oleophilic end, but it's basically the same principle. Right? It attaches to one part of it attaches to dirt, and then the hydro the hydrophilic end pulls it into solution by surrounding it with silk bubbles. Right. <clears throat> so it's very common to refer to this dibal component as a surfactant, because it's acting like so. What we use is a slightly different system. <clears throat> Instead of putting it into a polar solvent where the hydrophilic parts are on the outside, what we do is put it in a non-polar solvent so all, all the hydrophilic parts are on the inside. And so we have basically a little bubble or what we call a nanoreactor within which we can do chemistry. So the idea is that if you can do solution chemistry <clears throat> in a beaker, you can also do it inside these tiny little beakers, basically, that's the idea. And so that's what we do, is that we add different kinds of reagents you might add a salt, you might add some kind of reducing agent, <clears throat> you can add different components, and you can access different types of chemical reactions. So again, these are sorts of things that you would normally do in solution in a beaker to produce, <clears throat> you know, not necessarily nanomaterials, but just any kind of material reaction. And the idea here is that the, the nano portion of it is really driven by the micelle itself, the micelle structure, its size, its shape, <clears throat> controls, what we get out of the nanoparticles. <clears throat> in the course of our, our research over the years, we've, we've used different kinds of approaches. You can do kind of what we call a one-step loading, where you only have one salt, <clears throat> and then through a variety of other, other interactions, so your plasma or with some other interactions on the outside, you get your particle of interest. <clears throat> you can also do a two-step loading type reaction where you add two different precursors, they react with each other, inside the nanobeaker and form nanoparticles. Or you can take it a couple of steps further <clears throat> and do three steps. We haven't quite gotten to four steps, but we made that two to form kind of four shell type structures. So you form an initial particle and then you form another shell around that particle. <clears throat> so using these different kind of approaches in our lab over the years, we've produced a wide variety of nanoparticle materials <clears throat> for different applications. So our main, our three main uh, sort of applications that we targeted are <clears throat> sort of energy, sensing, and magneto optics. <clears throat> but we like to think of our technique as almost, almost a universal technique. You'll see we have a wide variety of materials that we've made in our labs. For example, things like metal oxides, <clears throat> which we've made up a wide variety of sort of turn or binary oxides, right? So just some kind of one metal plus an oxygen plus ternary or even quaternary type oxides, or you have multiple uh, metals <clears throat> combined with oxygen, indium tin oxide, fluorinated tin oxide, I2F, you know, that kind of thing. And we've used it in a wide variety of applications, including as anodes for electric for optoelectronic devices like OLEDs and OPVs, as well as <clears throat> for sort of uh, photoelectrochemical water splitting, places where you might 
take advantage of having a small, like a large surface area from having an outer surface. Right, so these are some of those those things. We've also done a lot of dielectric halides, <clears throat> again, mostly for optoelectronic devices, um, including <clears throat> looking at some of the, the, sort of the, the critical parameters that define the electric field in those sorts of systems, and then incorporating the image devices to try to improve device performance, right? <clears throat> utilizing these nanoparticle arrays. We've also made different kind of metal oxide or metal, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> and in fact, this is one of the, you know, we're not the only group in the world that does this. And this is the most common approach usually. <clears throat> when people use dye block copolymer reverse micelle synthesis, they're often targeting things like glue and platinum. And, but we also, and we also do that. <clears throat> We've made uh, different nanoparticle graphene composites, right? Because it's possible to graft these nanoparticles onto things like graphene or other types of structures, both in solution and once you deposit them on the surface. <clears throat> and of course, because it's a hot topic in material science, we also branched into looking at organohalide metal peroxides. And I'll talk a little bit more about these through the course of the of the talk, some of the interesting things that we found. By taking advantage of reverse micelles, we can get some interesting properties that are not possible using other approaches. <clears throat> And most recently, we've branched into these core shell type structures I mentioned using the sort of three-step loading approach to actually get <clears throat> you know, a functional nanoparticle in the middle covered by some kind of shell that allows you to now take advantage either of either the properties of the shell or the core or expose new properties because you have this heterojunction that exists internally within the nanoparticle. <clears throat> so Synthesis and understanding the synthesis process is really critical to having useful functional nanoparticles that we can use. And so we spend a lot of time trying to understand <clears throat> how particles are formed, but not only how they're formed, but how we can then use them, how we can bring out sort of interesting applications or interesting functions due to that synthesis process. And so <clears throat> it's really critical to have good control over the synthesis because, for an example, if you're going to make a peroxide material, Taking the, in that case, we use a two step loading, we load one reagent followed by a second one. And if you switch the order of those two, or if you pick the, the right order of your two reagents, you get a beautiful array of nanoparticles at the bottom. If you pick the wrong order, you use one of, in this case, we use the, the metal halide rather than the organic component first, you end up with a structure. You know, the micelle falls apart, you get nothing, right? <clears throat> so, you have to be very careful about how you're you're produce, sort of approaching your synthesis. Another another example is we're going to make some of these core shell type structures. It's sort of powerful. You can make different sort of thicknesses of the shell by adjusting the various parameters, and that also gives you access now, for example, to new states of matter. For example, <clears throat> by by virtue of having a gold shell forming over an oxide, you start to see these new sort of <clears throat> gold oxide states. That aren't possible without that support. One example that I wanted to to sort of highlight about this control of synthesis was when we were making some of these metal organic halide perovskites. <clears throat> and one of the big problems with these sorts of perovskites is their instability in a wide variety of, of, of aspects. But one of those ones in particular is <clears throat> if you have, for example, two components with two different halides and you mix them together, it's very difficult to maintain phase purity. Right, they'll tend to very quickly react with each other and form kind of an intermediate phase. So one of the nice things about our approach, because we separate out different different steps of loading, you physically separate the you know, the precursors, you, you separate them both physically and in time, so you have a little bit more control. And so you can actually, as I mentioned, if you can change, for example, the order in which you load either the organic or the inorganic components, you can either get successful nanoparticle arrays or not. <laughs> and if you change the even the halide type material, you might be able to get some nanoparticles, but your quality diversity goes to crap because it's not possible using certain certain approaches. <clears throat> so understanding this this byplay, this interplay of the different components, how the, the metal interacts with the polymer, how the halide interacts with the polymer, gives you all these different knobs to turn to achieve sort of a successful array.
<clears throat> and of course, that understanding that synthesis, slowing down the kinetics a little bit, gives you a chance to play around and to boost the, <clears throat> the efficiency, right? So how how capable these particular materials are of turning the light input into the light output. And so <clears throat> we just call it a photoluminescence on the wheel. So for example, we change our, we show here, <clears throat> I'm showing here the, the sort of kinetics of the formation of a methyl ammonium lead bromide, or typically if we're just mixing these in solution, <clears throat> they would tend to form on the order of milliseconds. We can actually slow down that reaction to something like 20 minutes, even it's even stable into sort of 24 hours. And that allows us to produce <clears throat> structures that are not possible using these sorts of precursors with other, other techniques. So I'm showing an example of what's called liquid assisted reprecipitation. It's a very common approach to making cross-cut nanoparticles. But for, if you're mixing together, <clears throat> for example, methyl ammonium iodide and lead bromide, you don't really get a good, good solid emission. <clears throat> but if you use our micelle technique, you can get this sort of high yield of around 40 or 50% conversion of light into emission. <clears throat> Additionally, because we separated out the two different components, when you add, it, typically if you're adding something, <clears throat> these two precursors are just loosened together because they react so spontaneously. It's hard sometimes to control the composition. <clears throat> you want to get a mixture of two different of, of iodides, for example. And so by separating out these two steps, we were able to, <clears throat> to show that a lot of our, a lot of the extra lead iodide that we were adding was actually precipitating out of solution instead of forming nanoparticles, and by just eliminating <clears throat> that extra lead iodide, we can get uh, almost a <clears throat> order of magnitude increase in the intensity of emission that we're able to get out of these sorts of materials. And, and <clears throat> not only that, but just by, you know, we're, we're looking here at the kind of emission from the mono array of nanoparticles on the surface that are separated you know, they're about six or seven nanometers in diameter, and they're separated by about 30 to 20 nanometers <clears throat> of spacing. And we can still see the emission from, from these sorts of films. <clears throat> and just by increasing the density of those, of those particles, so I have here an example of <clears throat> where we have quite well-separated nanoparticles here versus a quite a dense, densely packed array on the bottom. You can almost not see that they're nanoparticles. And this again leads to you know a six-fold increase in the emission under the same illumination condition. Right. So you can actually tune the quantum yield just by changing very, very simple synthesis parameters. <clears throat> and this allows us, as, as many people do, to sort of tune the emission profile by changing you know, the typical way is to just change the precursors, which we sort of do. You can get like the sort of full color, the full spectrum of emission. From nanoparticles with a lot of intensity, relatively high quantum yields above 50% <clears throat> across, you know, even from sort of bluefish blue almost into the infrared. But the unique sort of uniqueness of using the dye block copolymer is that using the same precursor mixtures without changing the precursor, we can also change this emission. Yeah. It's true. Some of them, some of them are broad. Some yeah. of them are. Some of them have kind of a long tail. Yeah. You know what those are? Well, most of it is yeah. because again, not all of these are, are fully optimized by combining. You know, right? So sometimes you get because this is because of this from this thing that we're talking about. You can actually get the same precursor without changing the time that it takes in the infiltrate. Your demisol from the solution, you can actually push <clears throat> the emission profiles of the green into the red. So, so in this case, it was a green that's growing dominated and the red is iodine dominated. So by, by changing the red to the green sign, the red sign, you can actually mod modify the red. Is that so reproducible? This one here? Uh, that's a good question. So that's the question of what's the reproducible part of the spectrum? Is it the main feature? The reversal part is usually the main feature. The only one might not be reproducible because it might be related to the mechanical process of variability. Yeah, I mean, I have to admit that this particular one that has a large fold here is not so reproducible. But these ones, where we can have two separate things that are not, that are not overlap at all, we've been able to reproduce quite a bit. Exactly. Same thing we often talk about, but sometimes they 
Every food will be so the best. Yeah, so I mean, you have to be very careful about how you produce them and what you do. But the nice thing about in this particular case of having the reproducible sort of two emission is that you can get a large soap shift because you have a board sheet happening in there. And you can really get you know, all of our emission is happening, the whole part of the happening in there. So that's one of the benefits of being able to tune the particular So it's very hard to do better. That's not just like it is. It's 150. This one we have not have a bigger one, about two two thirty nanometers for a for a slightly different number. I don't think we take it out. But it's possible to sort of really separate them by mixing these two groups. I won't need to that because that's yes. absolutely yes, we're very excited about it. So it's, it's something that we're we're really good. The problem, of course, is that it's not a, it's not a single true solution because it's kind of a longish low yeah. tail. But uh, but we we see that if we play around with that, we can even with that model. But we really it's something that we're really excited about. I and mean, we need to figure out what's what's really happening because one of the key questions is we're going to be all that time. We need to talk about it again. We need to figure out one of the key questions is really what's causing it. Are we having a number of <clears throat> a whole lot of particles that are absorbing, or there's some kind of a reports of like revenue occurring with allowing the second stage for the two minutes. These are questions that we haven't been able to answer yet. And so that's the that's the thing that we have to explore right now is what is the essence of what's inside the box side? Right? This, is, this is sometimes tricky because we have <clears throat> the problem is that the XRD is a little it's tricky in the system because they're small, they work a little bit. And um, and it's a little inconclusive because the, the mice are sort of puts pressure on the, the crystal and when you form it, it forms kind of unusual state at the beginning of the set. So something is definitely happening in these systems. But these are things that we're trying to explore. <clears throat> so this synthesis tuning then allows us to have <clears throat> sort of various phases for, for different applications. As I mentioned here, we have a large soap shift using this particular type of prospect, and we've been able to incorporate that into these OPV type materials as a down conversion layer outside of the of the device. So we know it's not contributing electrically, so it's purely a down conversion effect. Right? We're boosting the amount of light that's able to go into the system because we can absorb <clears throat> in, in the green region of and making the zone where this particular polymer is very absorbent. This also allows us, as I said, to get this kind of full spectrum of emissions from what are basically transparent films. Right? So the nice thing about it is we make this model layer, they're mostly transparent under under optical conditions. Unlike a lot of cross-bag systems that you may have seen, they're quite black because they absorb a lot, right? That's the whole point. But these systems are basically transparent, yet you can get illumination from these transparent films. So this opens up new avenues for for say uh, window coatings, things like that. Right? So there's some, some possibilities there. And then quite recently, since we started making these uh, core shell pit structures, so we make a metal oxide core or shell to <clears throat> around a perovskite core. And there we've seen that there's some really interesting uh, transfer interactions between the shell and the core that leads to sort of transient luminescence. And so we've seen some, <clears throat> some really interesting behavior that has not been observed in these prospect systems. Right. And since we start, spent so much time talking about that, I'm going to skip my next two examples. But basically, we can also use this kind of, of thing <clears throat> to uh, to learn about sort of magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, for example, which we've which we've been <clears throat> working on for a number of years. I'm just going to skip to our to what we can do with that. So it allows us to sort of <clears throat> again tune the properties. Tuning the structure to be able to change the phase without changing the size, change the order, for example, without <clears throat> affecting either the size or the phase, which can lead to interesting results, including the magnetic properties, you know, increasing the ability to uh, to do water splitting, these sorts of things. <clears throat> and then my my final little case study here on synthesis was all about making sort of core shell particles, and I'm going to skip that as well. Just to, uh, I'll just highlight though that we can sort of by changing what it is that we're mixing together, we can get these interesting new structures that are also magnetic, <clears throat> which we can then use for optical isolation, right? So we can use them kind of as, as sort of optical isolators in photonic circuits by sort of 
again, taking advantage of the fact that <clears throat> we have this poor shell interaction. So these are the ways that we can harness the synthesis of these materials um, in order to make, <clears throat> make different kinds of, of metal systems or material systems that we can use for various applications. Now, as, as we were sort of alluding to, these, these particular nanoparticles are produced in solution in the point of global suspension, but then we deposit them on the surface to take advantage of their, their characteristics. So we don't use them in solution, we usually put them onto a surface. <clears throat> and the typical way that we would do, as anybody would do, is to use spin coating, right? We want to get a nice uniform array. These arrays are typically formed by <clears throat> the self assembly of like these hard shell potential spheres. Right? So you can imagine just like taking sphere beads, taking them in a box. The optimal configuration is sort of this hexagonal closed pack system. The same kind of thing is happening when we deposit them on the surface. And though all the arrays I showed, or most of the arrays I showed, are from <clears throat> spin coating, it's actually quite agnostic to the technique. So it's possible to use spin coating. I apologize in the glare if it's not so obvious, but you can see that there's a similar size dispersity and, and even the, the packing is quite good the zip coding, the zip spin coding, the slot bag coding, or let's just say not so great, but you can still <clears throat> spray something. And then you can spray it. And whether it's found in organized array is still up in the way, we can still assume those properties. But basically, it's agnostic to any of these techniques. And you can still get the same size particles because the particles are based upon the micelles inside. Right? So as long as the micelles survive the process, excuse <clears> me, <throat> whatever you get on the surface is going to be an array of particles. Right? Again, they will tend to self-assemble into these hexagonal arrays. And there is an ability to, to tweak the pH, for example, or the salt, the the, the nature of the solvent slightly to get different packing when it forms on a surface. It's possible to get square packings, <clears throat> different kinds of packing structures. But the most natural one is hexagonal. And so we often aim for that, right? For simplicity. So <clears throat> but it is basically agnostic. And the nice thing is that so in addition to being kind of a universal technique for materials, it's also sort of universally depositable. <clears throat> and it's also not only by all these different techniques, but also sort of agnostic surface. It's possible to deposit, again, not exactly the same. They don't form the same arrays on different surfaces, so there's an effect of the surface tension, of the surface energy of the surface. But whether you have a high energy surface or a low energy surface, you still can get particles of finer own surface. Right? So <clears throat> that makes it really powerful because you can you don't have to care about the about the what's happening on your substrate, you can form them independently and then deposit them on the surface. So this is a huge value of the quantum dots that are called taxily because you're limited by what you can produce on a given surface. <clears throat> Not only that, we've also developed a number of, of printing techniques so we can take the nanoparticles off of a sacrificial surface and then put them on, for example, a polymer or other kinds of structures, <clears throat> just or, or in fact make these these kind of grafted, grafting nanoparticle composites to, in order to move the particles around from various surfaces. Right, so <clears throat> the final step that we usually use, and this is the one that can be a little tricky because not every material is able to withstand this process, but oxygen plasma etching is what we would normally use as our last step to remove the polymer from the surface. <clears throat> right, so the other thing to keep in mind from a nanoparticle synthesis perspective, the thing that's very different about <clears throat> using reverse micelles, and the reason we think about it like a reactor, is that in traditional sort of ligated synthesis, the ligands are permanently attached to the surface of your particle. That's why when you remove the ligands, you end up with lots of defect states. In this case, <clears throat> the particle will often form in situ inside the micelle and then detach itself if it is attached to all of to from the, the ligands. So it's kind of forming, so the ligands form this balloon shell, but they're not physically anchored to the surface, either through electrostatic interactions or sometimes even osmotic pressure that forces <clears throat> the, the precursors to go inside the mine cell. That means that, that the actual forming structure is built with its own, whatever defects are happening are there before you form the structure. So that gives you a lot of tunability and control. 
But the main way that we remove it then is to use still to use the oxygen plasma and other kind of plasma to attack the polymer and remove it from the surface. <clears throat> and we've explored a number of, of ways of doing that. Different plasmas have different effects. And oxygen plasma is, all, is all obviously quite useful if you want to make metal oxides, for example, <clears throat> because I mean, oxygen is a primary component of forming that oxide. But you can also swap it for other types of techniques with different levels of success, depending on what you want. It is, in fact, possible to use an ozone-type technique to just clean the polystyrene portion and use the, <clears throat> the hydrophilic portion in time. These kind of things can be beneficial if you want to have a decorated or functionalized structure. <clears throat> the name of the game, though, is nanoparticle uniformity, which is what we're always aiming for. So here's an example of of four different or five different, um, <clears throat> now, these are again cross cut nanoparticles that we made recently uh, with different sort of compositions, but all of them have very, very similar uniformities in terms of their, uh, their nanoparticle size. And I mean, the purity of their emission will vary depending on the material. These particular materials tend to be very broad in their emission. <clears throat> and the important thing from our perspective is not only are they interested in their uniformity, but also in the dispersion on the surface, right? The uniformity of the dispersion, how well we can make that hexagonal close packed array can have an impact on the collective use, on the use of these nanoparticles for their sort of collective property, <clears throat> right? But that's, this is ultimately the, one of the biggest benefits of using this approach is achieving high level of uniformity, regardless kind of of the material that you've picked to make. <clears throat> So there are many knobs that we can turn to achieve these different kinds of nanoparticle explosions. You can, you can do things like change the holding time, the ratios, the amount of solvent to polymer, right? All of these different things have an effect both on the size of the nanoparticle, the size of the myocell, their distribution on the surface, <clears throat> and and how you can, you know, you can by changing each of these different parameters, you can achieve a lot of different of a huge landscape of different types of particles with different dispersions and different sizes. <clears throat> because it's difficult to, and order is relatively easy just to see immediately, but it's hard to quantify disorder. So actually we spend a lot of time developing some tools that will allow us to, <clears throat> to produce those kinds of, of graphs that I showed, the sort of more noise tessellations called uh, dislocate, which I think we've interested, we can access it through GitHub. And um, and it's it's a mathematical package, but <clears throat> but uh, the the pack that we have on dislocate on GitHub will allow you to take any two dimensional array of, of particles. If, as long as you know what the centroid locations are, you can extract things like the uh, pair correlation function, <clears throat> graphs. You can get the one eye tessellations. You can see the bond order, etc. So this gives us a lot of power. Once we have that ability, we can get from any image. SEM, ASM, <clears throat> oxygen images, as long as you have an XY array of particle centroids, you can just immediately extract all of these, these sorts of parameters of interest about the spatial, the spatial characteristics, the nearest neighbor distance, the second nearest neighbor distance, et cetera. <clears throat> now, this kind of tool then allows us now to explore something that we're very interested in, which is uncoupling geometry from material properties. Right? Because when you form nanoparticle arrays of any kind, you're affecting both things simultaneously, right? You have a material at the interface, but you're also introducing roughness, like this topographical effect within any device. And this is particularly important for optoelectronic devices because that can affect the electric field that develops within that system. And so these are the things that we're really interested in exploring at Concordia particularly, is really honing in on, <clears throat> can we uncouple this ge geometric contribution from what are true materials contributions to these sorts of structures. <clears throat> and I can give sort of two examples. One is going back to that uh, water splitting study that we did before, where we were able to actually see for similar sized particles with similar dispersions, just by changing their order on the surface, <clears throat> we were able to boost the efficiency of those of the conversion for water splitting by about, I think 20, about 50% or so. We were doing this in collaboration with some different colleagues in Japan, where they were able to measure the current density when we have highly ordered systems 
versus one that were disordered or just without any output of the Right. So we were able to see this influence of just pure order on the structure. And then you can couple that with looking at the phase. I skipped over this part, but one of the things that we were also able to do is, <clears throat> is tune the structure of our iron oxide nanoparticles, for example, from being purely ferroelectric, purely <clears throat> magnetic, to anti ferromagnetic within with the same size of particle, without changing the particle size. We can actually just, just change the structure by tuning the conditions a little bit. And this again allowed us to, to access the new data that we got with the seminar. We were able to see that there's still a difference if you have a purely one pure phase versus the other phase with roughly the same size particles. So without you know, really trying to uncouple those two usually sort of convoluted uh, systems. Another example <clears throat> is the effect of order on the orientation of molecules for an organic light emitting diode. And the difference here is very subtle. There's not a huge difference in this case. We haven't optimized that away. But the principle is basically by introducing these nanoparticles, particles, we can start to see a, you know, a modification of the tilt angle of the nanoparticle, and changing the condition profile slightly. And by, by tuning again from purely order to disorder, we can see the impact of, of whether having a periodic roughness. <clears throat> or a Gaussian roughness makes a difference in terms of this organization, which is important for emission properties. And then finally, <clears throat> we can, uh, this is something that I've been doing for a very long time, but we're we, now because we have these techniques of depositing basically, you know, both directly and through transfer printing, we can introduce nanoparticles at every interface within any kind of optoelectronic device. And in all of those surfaces, we've seen some influence of these nanoparticles. And so, for example, here, again, we're trying to uncouple the geometry and the volume of material from its material from its impact. <clears throat> and we see that it does, it does change the, the charge injection characteristics. Right? So if I change the kind of a very small amount of material, that is like a very good, <clears throat> good interface material, you get better performance than if you have a lot of uh, a not so good material, you can sort of play those things off of each other. Um, <clears throat> and again, at the bottom of the phase and the top of the phase, we've seen similar social effects, as well as I already mentioned, the sort of down conversion idea <clears throat> using nanoparticle arrays on the surface. So really the, there we go. <clears throat> the key to everything that I've been talking about, what the, our sort of vision is, is really driving engineering with the underlying sort of science of how these nanoparticles form, the fundamental material properties that we can achieve, and how we can tweak them by modifying all these parameters that are available to us that are, you know, that give us this huge space to play up. <clears throat> and we're often interested in forming, you know, interesting heterostructures, particularly now using these core shell type materials to really harness properties that aren't possible if you don't have that kind of small intimate heterostructure available to you. <clears throat> and so, you know, what we aim for is going from one dimensional structures all the way to devices and understanding <clears throat> the role of, of the nanoparticles in, in every stage, basically. <clears throat> so I hope I've been able to convince you that reverse mindful deposition is a powerful tool to achieve a wide variety of nanostructures that have very small size distributions <clears throat> that are basically contamination free. I didn't talk about the purity of those phases, but you know we can get very nice crystalline structures <clears throat> without requiring a lot of energy. Because of the solution nature of it, we can deposit it almost universally on almost every surface. And we still have room to tweak the properties, right? We're not locked into a particular material system. We're not locked into a particular size. <clears throat> and so Having these controlled tunable surfaces where we have an array that we can understand now gives us access to things that are really hard to, to decipher, such as the role of, of geometry in sort of developing, for example, the electric field here in an organic device, things like this. So this is my, this is my overall pitch of everything. And I'd like to uh, just make a little pitch for our new, our new labs. So I did join Concordia earlier this year in January, and uh, we're, we're our labs are within the Center for Nanoscience Research, which is <clears throat> a relatively new, more, it's in a new building, it's not a new center, but we have this beautiful new building. So please come out to Loyola to NCS. 
Um, and there, I'm very happy to say that we have some nice, some nice labs for, for synthesis, making some devices within a large glow block structure, and also looking at the various types of spectroscopy. So we're always open to, to collaboration. If anybody's interested, come on out to Loyola and see us <clears throat> and uh, see our shiny new building. We're very excited about it. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators around the world, which includes a couple of faces that, that you may, may be familiar with, <clears throat> and the funders, obviously, and you for your attention. Thanks so much.